So it's January 25th. We are downloading the manufacturer data.xlsx file. And what's the in XLSX and XLSM? Macro. Yeah, ma XLSM is macro enabled. Can I have a macro kind of hidden in an XLS workbook? No. No, can't do it. All right, so we're downloading that and then opening it up. I'm going to go ahead and save it. We're going to use this data to, we're going to be making some labels. So I'm going to name it like make labels. Uh, winter 17. And I'll make sure it's an XLSM because we'll be adding to it. So here's a task for today. Actually, last time we were together, what was that? Monday. We, it was a grueling episode. I mean, it was like follow the bouncing ball. It was one disconnected example after another, after another, after another. The nice thing about that approach is that we can cover a lot of ground. The bad thing about that approach is at the end of the day, you're like, and what did we accomplish today? You know, we got exposed to a bunch of different stuff, but I don't really feel like I learned anything useful. So today, and we'll spend maybe a third or so of, of our lectures will be that approach, and about two thirds will be more like today, where we say, you know what, let's solve some kind of problem together and learn what we can learn about the topic along the way. And so for today, you know, imagine that you've got this list of, there have to be manufacturers, there could be some kind of clients, but the point is, you need to be able to, to, to box up some stuff and send things to an arbitrary set, you know, every once in a while. I gotta send, I got, you know, 12 new samples that I gotta send off to these folks. And so I need to print off a series of labels for this one, this one, this one, and these three. Now, first of all, is it possible to like write some kind of formulas, that functions, or formulas, that would take this data that's organized horizontally and put it you know, into vertical alignment so that we could print labels with it? The answer is yes, but it is crazy complex to do with formulas. I mean, it is absurdly complex. With VBA, it's not too bad. And so we're gonna, that's that's where we're headed today. So let's go ahead and open up our code editor. And hmm. oh, I've got this funk res. That's actually that's, this is showing up because I've got like the what is it, the analysis tool pack installed. So you've got the analysis tool pack and solver. You've got a couple of others here, that's okay. Here we are on make labels. This workbook that I just opened. Now, I had a couple of students kind of accidentally stumble into these two objects right here. Let's think of this first one, sheet one, vendors. We've got different properties that we can set about the sheet. We talked about being able to make a sheet very hidden. We do that here. But if you kind of inadvertently double click one of these, all of a sudden you've got a module. This is a module that is built into this sheet. It's a special module. We don't want to use, we'll use these modules later in class. This is what, we, we use these modules for creating event sub-procedures. So far, the sub-procedures we've been writing are just general sub-procedures. You execute them, you want to execute them, you say run this sub-procedure. Put a hot key on it, the user says I'm running this sub-procedure. You can put a button in the ribbon, I'm running this sub-procedure. With an event sub-procedure, you can make it happen automatically without the user even knowing what's going on. Here's an example. I'm going to encourage you not to do this with me, but just watch, because this is we're not building on this. I'm just showing you what these are for, and then I'm going to encourage you not to use these modules. We'll use a different kind. So I'm going to select the worksheet, and the default, here's the different events that, that worksheet can respond to. When the worksheet gets activated, before the worksheet gets deleted, when this worksheet gets recalculated, when, it's, when anything on this worksheet is changed, even just when the selection gets changed. You want to annoy your friends? Here you go. Every time the selection gets changed, put a message box up that says, congratulations. You just selected. And you see, it passes the target in that you've just selected. So I can, that's a range, so I can say target dot address. Okay, so I'm over here, I change which cell. Congratulations, you just selected D5. Congratulations, you just selected K11. Congratulations, you just selected E7 to E17. The point is, is that that's what these modules are for. 
is they are to make code that gets executed because something happened, either in the worksheet or in the workbook. And so they're powerful, but they're not for us yet. Question. Yeah. What's the functional purpose of having multiple modules in the same workbook? When you just have separate sub Oh, yeah. So, so you, you notice now that you can have multiple sub procedures in the same module. So why would, why do you need multiple modules? Here's the answer. There's two answers. One, a module has some limit in terms of the number of lines of code it can have. 40,000 lines of code or something, and you just can't put any more into it. There's kind of a technical limitation there. But a more important limitation is you might say, I want to have a library of certain procedures that, you know, when I'm working, and here's a good example. When I'm doing a project that has to connect on to a website and interact with a password protected website and download data, there's a whole set of procedures that I want to have at my fingertips. And so I'm going to keep those in a module. And then when I start a new project and say, oh, this project's going to be interacting with the web server, I'm just going to bring that whole module in. And I know I've got that library of procedures ready to go. But it's just uh, organizational. Just purposes. for organization, yeah. yeah. Functionality. So the question is, there's no functional difference. And the answer is, yeah, we're going to learn about scopes. And we could say there are some procedures that are only available to be called by other procedures in the same module. I see. So there, there is some other. The, the big thing is organization. But you can say it would be possible to have, for instance, three different modules, all with the same procedure name in it to do different things. And when one of those is called by a procedure inside that same module, it would call that one. Otherwise, it would call the other one, call the other one. So there's some kind of complex and advanced things that we can do, but let's not worry. Let's not trouble ourselves. Okay. At this point, let's just say that's really just for organization. OK. So here's, here's what I want to do. Let's go ahead and make another sheet. Uh, I'm going to call this one L, L A B E. I'll call it label. So I'll put a capital L, label. It's going to be for my set of labels, L-A-B, L-E, L-A-B. Did I put it back before I had OK, so what I'd like to do is I would like to be able to say, listen, I've got these first five rows. That's where i got to put the first address, or the first four rows. The next address has to go on start on row five because my labels are a certain size. And so I've got to actually make them start right in the right place. But here's the troubling part. If I come over here and look at my vendor data, I've got an address two column that is almost always blank. And occasionally, it takes two lines of address to get us to the right place. And so when I'm building that address, let's just suppose that, let's well, suppose I've got a label in here. Let's say I'm one of the vendors. Address 854 North 1375 West. That's my real address, by the way. Come help me shovel snow tonight. Provo. <laughs> oh, you fixed my. Oh, by the way, speaking of the car, I was right what, with no hesitation. The $1,200 car, we're going to spend 400 bucks on it to fix the four wheel drive. Um, and I picked it up last night. It seems to work. So, okay. Least for now. Provo, Utah, 84604. Don't send cash to the mail. Okay, so now here's the trouble is that an address could look like this, or it could look like this. You could have two address lines. Suite 125. Well, well, and so the code has to be able to fit. What I don't want is to have a blank line. Right? I want those to collapse down so that they're just, they look like proper addresses. So here's the first problem. First problem is, oh, oh now, and I also, it's, I'm not just generating a whole list. I want to be able to do these one at a time. I want to come right here and say, boom, produce the label for this one. Click on this row, make a label for this, probably a hotkey, maybe control shift L. Control shift L, make the label. I just have it add these labels up. So it has to kind of, it has to work independently from some master control. It needs to be able to say, ah, whatever labels are out there right now, you want to be able to add another one <coughs> to the end. And so that's what we've got here. So step one, let's create a sub procedure. 
sub make one label. While I'm at it, I'm going to assign the hotkey straight away. How do I assign a hotkey? Come back to my developer tab and open up my list of macros. Oh, I put that exactly where I'm not supposed to put it. See how it says sheet one, make one label? It's telling me this thing is kind of built into sheet one. Now I open this to tell you not to put it there. I'm going to copy that out. I'm closing this. I'm going to insert a regular old module. That's the one I want to work with. And I want to make sure I insert the right project. And on this project, insert module. Okay. So now I've got my sub procedure here inside a general module, not inside a sheet one. And I want to assign a shortcut key developer, macros, and then options. <coughs> Choose the macro that I want, options, and then put the shortcut key here. I'll put capital L, that'll be control shift. So now when I'm looking at my vendor tab, options was the guy that got me there. When I'm looking at my vendor tab, I just press control shift L and it will execute this procedure, which hopefully will build the label in the proper place and the proper spacing for whichever macro or whichever vendor I, I have selected on the active list. Okay, any questions so far? You need help getting the hotkey set up, set again? Anyone need help with the hotkey? So, to, to once we've, so first of all, we have to have the sub procedure at least stubbed in. It's not doing anything yet, but it's got to exist. So sub, make one label. It's in a general module. I'm then going to choose my developer tab and come to my list of macros. Select the macro I want, make one label, and click on options. This is the place where I do it. Well, where, do we, where do we want to save it? Okay, so we're not recording a macro here. We're just, we're making that macro and we're putting it, it's going to be in this workbook. Oh, is that an option to change it? Stand by. No. Oh, this is asking, this is saying, what set of macros do you want to look at? And it, it doesn't matter. So it could be all open workbooks. I one workbook open. So all open workbooks would do it. It is this workbook, so that would be right. And yeah, this, these are three things that are looking at exactly the same workbook. This is this all this is doing is asking you which macro do you which set of macros do you want to display? If you've got twelve workbooks open and they all have macros, it can be kind of hard to find the one that you want. So it's nice to be able to say no, 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 just show the one in this one or the app. Okay. Well, I can do control shift L now and it will run that macro, but it doesn't do anything because it's not doing anything. Nothing. Okay, so step one has to be for us to figure out which row we want to write to. How are we going to figure that out? Well, if we look at our list of labels, the data could end anywhere. And we know that we've got to start on the next available multiple of five. So in this case, we want to start on row 10. How are we going to figure that out? First of all, how can we tell if a row is a multiple of five? We got you know, row number, here we are on row number nine. Is that a multiple of five? How can we tell? Count on your fingers? No, it's not one of those. That's not, you, you can't just tell VBA to count on its fingers. So how are you going to do it? Ah, if it's evenly divisible by 5, then it's multiple of 5. Yeah, okay. So can we do evenly divisible by 5? Do you remember the fourth grade? I have some pretty disturbing memories from the fourth grade. Long division is not one of them, but it's a memory I have from the fourth grade. So we will learn long division. Do you remember this? You like put a number, you drew some kind of shape, and you had a divisor and a dividend, and you had to do the quotient, and you ended up with a what? Remainder. Remainder. 
So one way to, another way to say is it evenly divisible by 5 is to say, well, divide that number by 5 and ask if the remainder is 0. That would be evenly divisible by 5. There's an operation built into VBA and most programming languages that will just tell you what's the, what's the remainder if I divide one number by another. Incidentally, what's the name of that operation just in mathematics? Yeah, modulus or modulo. And so and that name comes through right here. So we could take 9... You go to have I'm going to print, question mark, print 9 mod 5. This says, give me the remainder if I take 9 and divide it by 5. What's the remainder? 4, and that will tell me 4. And so if I take 10 mod 5, is 10 a multiple of 5? Yes. Yeah. And so the remainder, when I take 10 and divide it by 5, is going to be 0. So that's going to be helpful to me to be able to figure this out. But before I, before I use that modulus operation, I've got to figure out what's my last available, or what's my next available data. How do we tell Excel to figure out where to start looking? Okay, so I could create a loop that starts here and just looks down until it finds what? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm asking. What do you want to find? If I just look for a blank row, and I'll start here, and I'll find this one. So we're looking for well, the last line of text. Someone said control down. Control down all the way to the bottom. Control up. Control down. Oh, okay. So you're saying start at the very bottom of the worksheet, and then do control up, and that will until it bumps into some data. That's probably the cleanest way to do it. Start at the very bottom and come up until you hit something, and then you know there was nothing between the end and where you are now. You're free to write going down. Okay, so let's see how I do that through code. I'm going to need some way to remember the row that I have found. Now, I think in Chapter 6, we're going to get introduced to the painful details of variables. But today, okay, we're laughing about variables being painful. There are some painful things about variables. I'll prove it to you in chapter six. But for now, we're just gonna, we're gonna without teaching you all the details of it, we're gonna say, hey, I need a place I can store a value and then call it back. We could put it into a cell, but I wanna introduce you lightly to variables here. So here's how we create a variable. And the variable is just a place where I can store a value and then later in code say, hey, what was that number? I need to remember that number again. Here's how we do it. Dim, I'm just gonna call it R, dim R. I have now told the interpreter, allocate some memory that I can store a value, and we'll use that name. So when I ask for it, I can use that name to refer to that location. Okay, so now I want to say R equals, and in this case, looking at this data right here, ultimately I want R to equal <coughs> 1. I want it to be equal to 10, but my first step is to find out what's the last used row of data. So let's start off with that. I want this to equal 8. So whatever I put ultimately has to result in an 8. Now, of course, I can't just put the 8 there. It'll be different as soon as I make it a label. And so I'm going to say, all right, I want to look at, ooh, we better look at the particular worksheet. And so this worksheet is called label. Sheets label dot cells. Now, I want to look in. So we'll come back to the row in a second. I want to look in that, in that column. Column 1. Whenever I have an ordered pair in Excel, it's row first, then column. So, I want to start the very last row. What's the very last row? 1, 0, 4, I don't know, there's some number. What is it? One zero four eight five seven six. Pretty close. One zero four eight <coughs> five seven six. <coughs> yeah, one point oh four million. Now, that would probably be just fine. For this application, that would probably be just fine. But hey, what's going to happen when Excel 2017 comes out and it doesn't have 1.04 million rows, it's got 20 bajillion rows? Is this going to refer to the last cell anymore? No. no. I'd like to refer to the last cell. It turns out that I can actually ask how many rows there are on the active sheet. Rows.count. 
That's how many there are. Is there a function you can do to just do that? Let's go rows by counting them. So in case you want to change the number. Yes, it's not a function, it's a property. In fact, it's right here. I'm just going to take that expression and I'm going to put it right here. And so this says, hey, I'm talking about a particular cell on a particular sheet. Which row is it? However many rows there are. If there's, if this code got copied over to an X, uh, what did you call it? XLS workbook, like before 2007, there's only like 32,000 rows. This would mean 32,000. It would still work just fine. Yeah. So, do we need to also follow the camel fits in for naming variables? Do, uh, do we need to follow? Okay, so you're talking about, you said camel case, which is a technique where we start the first letter of a compound word in capital. <coughs> oh, here, do I need to, is this case, so you're asking if this is case sensitive? No, no, the no. Is it, here. Do we need to follow that convention for naming the variables also? So R, 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 R. R. Oh, should R be capital? Is that what you're asking here? Yeah, and you only have one letter, you can't have camel case. Camel case is, you know, in a compound word. So the answer is no. Um, but whatever case I establish for the variable, the editor will force all other references to that variable to have the same case. I mean, it will, it doesn't have to match, but the editor is going to make it match. Well, I know syntactically it's fine, but then is that a convention to do that? Oh, is it a convention? Yeah. Um, yeah, but there are multiple conventions you could follow. So, yeah, feel free to name them however you want. I couldn't care less. Yep. R-I-A-D-O-E. So yeah, so the question is, what does dim R mean? And the answer is, we'll talk specifically about why the word is dim instead of some other word. But at this point, I just want you to say, okay, you're creating a variable. You're making a location that I can plug a value in, let it sit around for a while, let it age until I'm ready to use it, and then bring it back out. Okay, so at this point now, to this, at this point, we have referred to a particular cell on a particular sheet. That's not actually the one we want. But let me just show, let me, let's just take a look at what this part is doing. So I'm going to print that one's address. That's going to tell me that's A, 1.04 million. Now, did it select that cell? No, it was already selected. Come back up here. Let me run that again. It didn't change which one was active. I never told it to select it. This is your first major conceptual shift that you have to make to work in VBA. And that is, when you're just working in Excel, when you do something with a cell, you select the cell, and then you do something to that cell. This is the way it happens. When you record yourself doing something in Excel, because that's what it does, it records yourself saying, select the cell, and do something with the selected cell. But as a VBA, as a VBA coder, <laughs> someone writing code, you got to say to yourself, is there any compelling reason to select that cell? And if there's not, you don't select it. Well, why not just select it all the time anyway? It will really slow. If you're doing something that is changing sheets and selecting cells, like iterating lots of times, it will dramatically slow your code down. Really? Yes. Here's the thing. What's the most expensive personal computer you could buy? I mean, what's it designed to do, do you know? Yeah, it's gaming computers. What what are you buying with that? You're spending five thousand dollars on a computer. What are you getting for that? Speed. Yeah, yeah, speed. But specifically, so I heard someone say it. Yeah, well, so it's graphics. I thought someone said FPS, frames per second. Yeah, what you're trying, to, what you're doing is you're buying a computer that can completely redraw that screen in sixteen million colors, sixty times a second. And it's expensive to have hardware that can do that. What can this computer do? Nothing near that. One of the most expensive things we do is to say, I want to, I want to change all those pixels that are on the screen right now to be something else. Yeah. And so these gaming computers can do that multiple, multiple, multiple times in a second. And so when you make Excel redraw the screen, that's a time-consuming process. And when you select a cell that's outside of the currently displayed cells, it's got to redraw the whole screen. So you really want to avoid this. So that's, the, that's the step here is we're saying, 
We're going to refer to the cell, but we are not going to select it. And kind of an important step in your development as VBA wizards. Don't select a cell unless there's a really compelling reason to do it. Will you turn off screen updating? Is that still happening in the background? Ah. So it's still... Yeah, so there's this thing from the application you can say, hey, turn screen updating off. And the answer is that will speed things up. Uh, I'm not sure if it is... Um, it will speed things up almost as fast as not selecting it, but it still is a separate process to select the cell. Actually, it's selected. It just doesn't have to go through the pain of redrawing the screen. And that is most of the time. So turning screen updating off will have largely the same effect. As a developer, you should write it cleanly. Okay. So, we're is this, by the way, is this the cell we want? No, no. We want from there, we want to come up until we bump into some data. Well, it turns out that every range, at least every cell, has a method called end. I think we talked about this. Back before they invented the control key, we would actually do what you do with control up and down arrow now. We would do it with two keystrokes. Did I talk about this? You hit the end key and then the up arrow key, and then that, that does the same thing as a control up arrow key does. But that's the reason why this is called end. End, and then we tell it we're going to go up, down, left, or right, X, L, up. Not in quotes. We'll talk about why this doesn't go in quotes in detail later. It's called a constant. Excel looks at that and figures out, oh, you mean a particular number. Incidentally, think about it. Never mind. We'll look like it. Well, that just means up. That now is going to refer to a different cell. Let's print the address off of that one. Aha, that's the one I'm talking about. Did it select that cell? No, never selected it. It just referred to it. Now, I don't want the whole address. What do I want? I want to know the row that it's on. And so a cell has a property called row. It just tells them that's the row the cell is on. And so that should... get me to the last row that has data on it. Whew. Next, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna step through this code and see if it works. F8 will let me step one line at a time. It's now executed that line. I should be able to look at R and look at R and R is eight. By the way, if I want to look at the contents of R, R still has to be loaded into memory. R still has to be, the code has to be running. And so right now, when I have a yellow line here, that means the code is running, everything is suspended in memory, doing what I've told it to do. But as soon as I get to that end sub, as soon as I execute that line, then it has released everything that I was just working on. And R doesn't equal 18. R is just, don't know, whatever R is, I don't know, just empty. Okay? We get this, okay. We're looking at this, how many of you are going, I, I get this. No way I could have written this, but I, get, I understand it. Okay. That's where I expect you to be. You've talked through it, you say, okay, I'm following that. You'll be able to write stuff like this before too long, but you're, you're brand new at this. You can do this for a couple of weeks. Okay. So now, I've got eight, and I've got to make eight ten. I've got to get eight to the next multiple of five. How am I going to do it? It's going to involve mod, but I want to say r is going to equal a new value. What's it going to be? It's going to be some expression. Can you figure it out? Think about it. Can you give me some expression that will take, we'll just start with 8. We'll take 8 and return 10. Well, yeah, 8 plus 2 will do it, but come on. It's got to be something that's going to look for the next multiple of 5. Any thoughts? Okay, so here, right now I'm just going to work with the 8. Right now R is 8, so let me just use 8 so we can see it. 8 mod 5. That's going to be 3. Five minus 8 mod 5. Okay, so you want to say, you want to put the 8 in here too. 8 plus 5 minus R mod 5. That gets us to 10. All right, let's see if that's right. Let's put this up to like um, 14. What should this produce if it's right? 15 looks pretty good. Let's take it down to 1. 
5, I like it. Let's put 1024. What should that give? 1025. Yeah, I like it. I think that expression is going to do the trick. Now, I'm expecting <laughs> most of you to be looking at this and going, whoa, that was like math. I didn't listen to the math class. That's as mathy as we get. We probably aren't going to do much more anything like this. So but that is one thing that you will find in programming is you got to kind of think about, hmm, how am I going to take this number and get it to behave the way I want to in some mathematical expression will do. So now I'm just going to take that expression there, and I'm going to say, all right, well, R, and we can do this all with one statement, but I'm going to do it with two. R equals what it used to be plus 5 minus R mod 5. And again, let me step through this and see what, what that gives me for R. FH to come one line at a time. I executed this line. Let me see what R is. R is 10. All right. So now we, we, we figured out R. That is where we need to write that very next label. Feeling pretty good about it. So let's write it out. First thing I'm going to want to make sure, I want to make sure that I'm actually on my vendor's sheet. The idea here is that whatever the active cell is, that's the vendor I want. So I'm going to be reading from my vendor's sheet. So before I even do the rest of this stuff, let's make sure that we activate that sheet. So sheets, vendors. I'm going to put it at the very top. That's just me saying, hey, let's make sure. It would work anywhere because we're not referring to the sheet yet. But I want to say, hey, as we start this off, let's make sure we've got the right sheet active. You're doing it after the variable declaration. I am doing it after the variable declaration. Okay. Now, the convention is put the variable declarations at the top. They don't have to go there, but, but, but all the we'll talk about that later when we do that. V E N D O R S dot activate. Okay, so now we know that sheet is active, and I am ready now to write to the label sheet. So sheets label hmm, dot cells. Okay, so I'm back to the right sheet. Now, which cell do I want to write to? R. Yeah, I just I spent all that time to figure out the row I'm going to write to. That's R. Which column? One. Yeah, I'm writing all my labels in that first column. Value. I'm changing the value of that cell. What is it going to be? Well, let's look over here at my active sheet. Now, my sheet now is vendors. So I don't have to say sheets vendors. I know that's my active sheet. So I'll just say cells. Which row do I want? Let's skip the row for just a second. Which column do I want? What I want in my label to be first is this column J, because this is the contact that we have at that vendor or that manufacturer. And so column J. So J is 10. I can either put a 10 here, or what can I, else can I put? In quotes, I can put the J. Dot, dot. Question in the back? So five, which five cells are you referring to address one in the postal code? Are those the five? Am I referring to address one? Okay, the question is, why, why, do we want, why do we care about five? The reason we care about five is because we, based on the size of labels we're going to be printing on, it's got to be, they're all right next to each other. So, main, sequence, address. We're going to have some data here, and then we've got to go to the next set of five, we're going to put the next address. It's, no, oh, no. We're only going to have three or four lines of address. So it'll be, the, it'll be the contact, it'll be address one. If there's an address two, it'll be address two. And the next line will be city, state, zip, all in one line. Because we're making, a, we're making the mailing label. The name, address, address two, city, zip, all in Right. The reason we need five is because that's going to give us the right space to get to the next label on the print. And the truth of the matter is, it might be seven. But we did five because figuring out multiples of five is easier than figuring out multiples of seven. So while we're working through it, I wanted an easy multiple to work with. 
Yes. Oh yeah, you found my dirty little secret. The first label only really has four. Yeah, we probably shouldn't start on that first label. So we should put something up here at the top that says um, labels. Or we could shift it down a little bit. But here, let's just live with it. Let's live with that little that little defect in this algorithm. Let's just live with it. Oh yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Because it would it would come up, it would find one, it would ask what the next multiple of five is, it would come to the five. But you're right, that's going to give us something at the top that we might need to adjust actually to get it to start printing in the right place. Since we're not actually printing, I don't want to have to deal with that. Very good. Okay. Question. Question. Can we put like J as the um, column there. If someone inserts a column somewhere along the way, that, that's going to throw up. Here's the question. What happens if someone inserts a column in our data? Are we in trouble? Ah, yeah, so if we were doing an Excel formula, then it would go, oh, slow down. Someone just inserted a column. Everybody adjust your column references. There is no such connection between VBA code and the Excel workbook. Someone inserts a column, this thing's busted. Unless we start off by saying, let's find the column that has the contact. I'm not opposed to doing that. It's adding complexity here that you probably don't want to feel today. Can you just make a table and it has a name? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's lots of ways we can solve that problem. So one, we could refer to it by its name if it's in a table. Um, the way I would prefer to do it is to say, hey, let's start by looking at row one. Find which column is the contact, remember that column number, and then instead of putting J, that would be another variable that we would just slide in. So there's a solution to that problem. Let's not come, let's not make this example more complex. Okay. 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 But now we have to know which row we want to write to. How can we tell which row we want? Which, which, I'm sorry, which row, which row we're getting the value from? How can we tell the row we want? So we want to print which, and we want to print the address for whichever vendor is on the row that has the active cell. Well, there's an object called active cell, and it will tell us active cell address. So I can refer to that active cell and say, hey, wherever it is. What I really want is the active row. Is there an active row object? No. Oh, I heard it. What is it? Yeah, I can ask for the row of any cell, including the active cell. And so I'm just going to say active cell dot row, and I'll put that in for my row. So folks, these lines can get pretty complex. When we're looking here, we're putting cells.count as an argument, active cell.row as an argument. They can look pretty ugly, but if we kind of build them step by step, okay, it's not too bad. Question over here. Is there exactly one active cell per workbook? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Is there only one active cell per workbook? The answer is yes, there's only one active cell per workbook. There may only be one active cell for the whole Excel. We have to check to see, but I think there actually is an active cell in each workbook. So one follow-up question to that. If you if you're in one if you're in an active sheet and you want to guess the cell that's selected non-active sheet. Okay, here's, yeah, it's a good question. I hear it coming. <laughs> here's what you're saying. I'm on this sheet. Look, if I peek over here at labels, the active cell right here is A11. When I leave, what's the active cell now? J1. It's J1 over here. But if only the label cell sheet were activated, I can immediately remember that's the one that's active on it. Is there a way to be able to refer to that sheet and say, hey, listen, sheet, if you were active, which cell would be active? So far as I know, there's no way to do that. Oh, really? Activate it. You've got to activate the cell, You've got to activate the sheet. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that Google, a little Googling would tell you for sure. 
But uh, I, I've never come across a way to do that. Because if you ran what you're building right now with labels to active sheet, it wouldn't work. It would be a problem, yeah. And that's the very reason why I said we better start off by making the vendors the active sheet option. And did a lot of vendors go back to that remembered active sheet? Yeah, yeah. When you activate that sheet, it remembers the stuff that was active last row here. The fact that it remembers makes me think there must be some way to get at it through code. Right. Um, I put Google would do it. You probably do it for the between classes and each other. That's what I found. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you guys put it. No. Okay. All right. So now I think that's it. Let's see if this works. So if I run this, let's think about what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to come here, and start at the bottom, come up, get to A1, go to the next, next multiple of five. It should be five. And then we're saying we want to take whatever is here and put it over here. Yeah, I think that'll work. We run that, and it should. Let me make sure I know the one I'm thinking of. Carol Reynolds. We should put Carol Reynolds. I'm on J4, my vendor sheet. I run this, it should put Carol Reynolds into A5 of the label sheet. Let's see how well that works. Let's try again. Okay, I must not have rest. Let's put it on key. Okay, so that then put Carol Reynolds there. Okay, in class example, are you ready? An in class exercise. Give me another line right after this one that puts address one right below Carol Reynolds. We'll take one minute. You've got one minute to do this. Okay, so this assignment statement, there's two halves. I'm reading something on the right-hand side of this, and I'm going to take whatever that evaluates to, and I'm putting it on the left-hand side. So I'm just going to copy this line, this line, and say, look, I, I don't want to write to R. I want to write to the next row down. So I can do R plus 1. That's one way to do it. Or I could come here and say, you know what? Let me just change the value of R before I get there. So now the line is the same. It's R. Just R is now a different value by the time I get to this line. You're going to see why I favor this approach here shortly. So now I'm writing to the right cell. Now I just have to read from the right cell, and I think that's in column C. Is it column C? Yeah. So still the same row, pulling the value out of column C, writing it to the same column, but now one more row down. So if I run that, it should give me now two values in the label. There it is. Carol Reynolds, and we've got address. Okay, questions here? Okay, let's do one more thing while we're at this, just because your postman will be happier if you do this. By the way, does the post, does the post office have rules about how you're supposed to address things? Yeah. Upper and lower case, what do you think? Do you like upper and lower or all upper? They like all uppercase. Why do they like all uppercase? Lowercase at all. It's because they're re they're reading these addresses with like scanners. They have to look at the stuff and figure it out. It's coming through, and something has to look at that, digitally read it, and they're saying, you know what? If we had just 26 characters to work with, that's better than twice that in the alphabet. So they want they want it all uppercase. And by the way, if you're asking for a discount on your postage, like you're doing some kind of bulk rate, don't be given a mixed case. They won't give you the discount. Believe me, I've tried. So instead of just writing this out, there's a function built into VBA called ucase. Whenever I give it, this is lowercase. It'll come back uppercase. If it's mixed case, it'll come back all uppercase. Is it whatever's there? What does it do to a number? Is it going to change a 2 into an at sign? No. Uppercase 2 is the same as the lowercase 2. Same 2. And so I'm just going to put ucase around these. That way we'll be building properly uppercase. I'll run that. That should give me an uppercase label over there. And now that looks good. Truth is, they don't even want that period. They don't even want any punctuation. They want me to get rid of that period. Uh, a little more work, we can do that as well, but let's not worry about that. Okay, the next step is a little more difficult. 
Because what we've got to do here is we have to say, if there's an address to, put an address to. If there's not an address to, don't. But importantly, don't change what R we're looking at. Don't change the row that we're writing to. Let's just do this. If this was, and if there is an uppercase, or if there is an address to, it would look like this. Add one to it, and then address two is column. I'm going to go ahead and put that on one that is an address two, so we can see that that brings address two in correctly. Okay, so I'm now on an address two line. We just copied the same two lines before, so we incremented R, both of looking column D. Here it is, we got address two. Michael Payton. Is that the guy who's in the Super Bowl? Has the Super Bowl happened already? <laughs> when is it? Oh, it's in February? Is there some Payton who's in the, who's in the game this year? That was last year? Who's the guy this year? Um, Brady. Brady. Well, that's what I heard. I heard him talking about Brady on the radio. Never mind. Peyton was last year. Uh, apparently, this is his brother, and he's somewhere in manufacturing. Okay. Now, here's the trick. If there's no address 2, we don't want to write out address 2, and we don't want to change R. We don't want either of these lines to happen. If there's no address to. Another way to say that is we only want these lines to happen if there is an address to. So let's take a look. Here's where I'm looking to see what address to is. I'm just going to copy that. And we're going to do an if statement, folks. We've got a whole chapter that talks about if. I'm just going to, we're going to tease you a little bit here. If I'll have some expression here, I'll then say then, and then I'll have an end if. That says this whole block is going to be conditional. If whatever I put in here between the if and the then evaluates to true, we're going to run these lines. If whatever I put in there evaluates to false, we're going to skip these lines, go to the end if, and then just keep moving on. So what I want to say is I want to look at where the address 2 is, and I want to know if that is equal to a zero length string. If that is a zero length string, Oh, it's the opposite. If it's different from a zero length string, we want to do this. So I'm going to do this. Instead of equal, I'm going to say not equal to, less than or greater than. It turns out, when I'm checking to see if a string is different from empty, it's actually preferred to do it this way. Is it greater than a zero length string? There is no string smaller than an empty string. Any string that has at least one character, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be bigger than an empty string. There's no reason to say, is it less than an empty string? Nothing is less than an empty string. Yeah. Yeah. Count space bars. Well, this counts space bars. Yeah, you like this, uh, oh, yeah. If there's a space there, it's going to treat it like a space. Is it going to treat it like a space? Yeah, let's, let's actually build one like that and see what happens. And if you like, you can fix it. The question is, what if it's a space? Because if it's a space, I really don't want to have it there. We'll see how we can solve that problem. Okay, so let's leave that now, and we won't really see this work until we get the next line going in. So let's put the next line, and then we can check this one. So again, I'm going to copy the line that has the R plus 1, and then referring to that cell. <coughs> All right. This one is a little bit more complicated because I've got to take three cells. I've got to take city, state, and zip, city, state, zip, and put them onto one line. So city is E. Hmm. Now, my screen, this isn't very wide. And if you just want to put all this on one line and have it scroll off the page, you're welcome to do that. I'm going to break this into multiple lines just so you can see it better here on the screen. So I am going to concatenate, there's a little more room here. I am going to concatenate on a space, and then I'm going to concatenate on the next cell. It won't fit here on this line, it could scroll over. 
So I'm going to end this line with an underscore. What that says is, first of all, in VBA there's an assumption. You, if you have one VBA statement, you're going to put it on one line. Most programming languages is just the opposite. It says if you have a statement, tell me when you're done. Put a semicolon at the end of it and tell me when you're done. And if you want to put it on more than one line until you see a, until the interpreter sees a semicolon, it's going great. It's all the same statement. In VBA, it says, look, you put a line, you just put one line per statement. And so if you want to break a statement across multiple lines, you've got to give it a character that says, hey, this statement is continued, and that's the underscore character. And so by putting this parenthesis that I'm pushing forward goes with the, with the U case. I want to uppercase everything in here. So then I want to bring on the next one right after this. And I'll space it over here just so we can see it line up. I want to, I'm putting something over here on my label sheet. I'm reading off of my vendor sheet, column E, then putting a space, then column F, then putting a space then column G. And I'm not going to add anything after that. I'll just go ahead and bring that parenthesis up there as well. I don't think I can space it or I think I'll suck that space out. So now I've got this long expression here that's taking three columns, bringing it into one column, putting a space between it, and then putting it onto the next cell. So if I run this right now, my active cell uh, we'll take a look at that in just a second. I think I've done the quotes right, but we'll take a look. So right now, I have no, I'm on a row with no address 2. I'll run that. Control shift L should run that. And let's take a look. Is that who I was talking to? I forgot. Eva Titus. Yeah, Eva Titus. So that came in without putting a space for row number 2. It started on a multiple of five, that looks good. Now I'll come to one that's got address two, control shift L. And that's now brought in all four lines of that address started on a multiple of five as well. Back to the code. So the question was something about do I have to double up the quotes? These quotes, none of these quotes are inside a string literal, so it just need to be single quotes. Questions? I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Do there need to be spaces between the very end after saying? Do these spaces need to be here? The answer is that space has to be there. The reason this one has to be there is that for historical reasons, ampersand is a valid symbol in a variable name or in, a, in an object name. No one ever uses it, but you could put it there. So without the space, it doesn't know that you mean concatenation by that. But this one doesn't have to be there. This would be okay without it. But when I leave the line, the editor is saying, hey, you know what, you should put some space there so it's just more readable. What about the second hand? This one right here? Yeah, there has to be a space before the underscore character. Line continuation character is really a two-character sequence. It's space, underscore. It's, they, they both have to be there. I think that's true. Yeah, if I get rid of that, it doesn't know what we're talking about. Got to be a space before it. Space before and a space after. Yeah, if you're having trouble, if you got if you have red letters and you can't figure it out, camera is itching to come and help you figure out what the syntax is. Yep. Is there a function? Say, there's a there's a function in Excel called concatenate. Is there one like that in VBA? And the answer is, I don't think so. It's definitely not a built-in part of the language. There may be an object that would do it. In fact, yeah, you can you can actually call Excel's concatenate function to concatenate. I won't show you that. It's kind of ugly, but it's possible. You're going to add a comma. We just put it right between state and Between city and state, you might want to put a comma. The post office doesn't want you to put a comma there. But if you want to put a comma there, this this is saying, listen, here we've got 
the value of that cell, and then here we're putting a space on it. If you want to put a comma, you just put the comma right before that space. Yeah, post office wants no punctuation. Okay, let's take a minute and help those that still have red letters. All right, we've got a couple more things that I want to do. First one came up. What about the phantom space? You know, some maniac put a space in there. Let's take a look. I'm going to come over here on this vendor. I'm not, I don't know, I'll just pick the vendor on line 20. And I'm going to put a space in there for uh, address 2. Now, with just a space, I should hope not just not to... You and I both know that a space is invisible. But VP doesn't know that. All VPA knows is it's a character. It's a character just like any other character. And so when we ask, is there a character there? It goes, yeah, there's a character there. There's, there's something besides blank there. So I'm, I'm expecting that when I run the code on this line, control shift L, that it will give me a blank line. It's not really blank. I can highlight that space. It's there. There's a space in there. So there's, there's kind of two approaches here. One is to say, you know, we could, camera, I'm sure that the BYU Risk Management Department doesn't approve, but. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I don't break your head. I mean, I lose a good TA, but other than that, I'm okay. All right. So two approaches. One would be, you know what? Before we do this, let's just run through all those, and if there's any that have just a space, make them blank. But there may be reasons why you don't really want to do that, and I can't think of why in this case you wouldn't want to do that, but there may be times to say, you know what? I want that space. So let's take a look at this. There is a function called trim. Now let's look at this. I'm going to... Let me print. Oh, thank you. I don't remember. I think I am recording. Recorder's recording. Thank you. Okay, so first let me just print off something. It's got a bunch of spaces. Spaces are kind of hard to see unless there's a bunch of them, then you can see them a little bit better. This is a test. Okay, if I print that, you're going to see, yeah, there's some spaces in there. They actually printed those spaces. Now, what trim does is it says you might have leading spaces or trailing spaces, but if you do, just get rid of them. Whatever spaces are on the front and on the back, throw them away. So, I, incidentally, I can also ask for the length of something. What's the length of that? It's 85. What's the length of it after it's trimmed? Let me trim it inside the length call. That's only 15. What's the length of something that doesn't have any characters in it? Zero. So I can take a string with spaces, any number of spaces, and if I trim, it's going to make it down to a zero length string. So when I'm doing the if statement for that, when I'm doing the if statement here, instead of checking to see if this is greater than zero length string, what will I do? I'll just trim it, yeah, so I'll take, I'm going to pass that value to the trim function and compare it to whatever the trim function returns. So trim, send this to trim, and then look at what comes back. So now, am I still on that line? I'm still on the line with a space, yep. Control shift L, come back to my label. Now it is to produce another label without that space. The space is still there. I didn't say get rid of the space. All I said was when I'm making the evaluation, don't look directly at the cell, the cell's value. Take that cell's value, send it over to the trim function, and look at whatever the trim function sends back. Question. Um, the trim function, is there one if you take out like excess spaces in a string? Oh, like if you've got, if you've got spaces in the middle you want to get rid of? Yeah. You want to get rid of all spaces? Or like, like if there's like two or three spaces, we only want one space. Oh, so you're saying I don't care how many spaces there are, if there's more, one or more, switch that down to one. There's no built-in function to do that. We could write it without not too much without. We could write it without not too much trouble. We could write it. We won't write it today. 
But if you remind me when we talk about loops, that would be a pretty good example for us to talk about when I introduce you to what a loop is. I've already introduced you, but we'll talk about some specifics. That'd be a good example. Okay, so this does a pretty good job of doing what I initially set out to do, which was to, to come here and say, I want to take this one, control shift L, load the label for that, control shift L for this one, and this one, control shift L. What's the next thing that is like totally reasonable to do? Yeah, let's just say I want to make, I want to print off labels for all of them. This actually is something very similar to what you have to do for the project, which is due when? February 1st. Is that the week from today? Today. Okay, so let's take a look. It's really pretty simple. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make another sub procedure. Sub uh, make all labels. Make all labels. And Here's the nice thing about, oh, you know what I should have make one label do? Hmm. No, I'm going to leave that one just the way it is. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to say, all right, let's make sure that we're going to start off by, well, make one label, make sure that the active sheet is vendors. So I guess I'll leave that right there. And we just want to do this multiple times. So I'll say do loop make one label. So remember what this do loop will do, the do just says, hey, here's the top of the loop. Loop says, go back to the do. This is a call to my other sub procedure. It says, just go run all the steps one at a time for make label, pop, 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 pop. Once you finish that, come back up here and do whatever, whatever else we're talking about doing. What do I want to do? I just, let's start off by sending us to the very top. I guess I do want to make sure I've got the vendor sheet active. I'm going to start off by activating the vendor sheet. Then I'm going to make sure that I'm on the right cell. Range A2.select. And now, when I do make one label, it's going to print that first label. Or it's going to put it over to the label sheet. If I say make another label, what's it going to, which one's it going to make? Same one. Same one. Yeah, it's, it doesn't, make one label doesn't change the active cell. And I think that's probably right. I don't want to change the active cell. But when I say make all labels, I want to make one label and then move down. So active cell dot offset one row and zero columns. This all this says is it says offset says refer to a different cell from whatever cell we're talking about. So from the active cell. I'm going to refer to a different cell, one that is down one row and over zero columns. And what do I want to do when I refer to it? I want to select it, make that the active cell. Not select. Offset is a production in printing called offset printing. It's a way to put ink on paper, letterpress, offset press. In this case, it's saying we want to move, I want to refer to a different cell. Well, where? I want you to be on this, you're thinking about this cell, offset to a different one. How many rows and columns do you want to move? You want to offset? You're not actually selecting anything until you say select. So just really quickly, if I had range A1 dot offset 10 rows and one column, and ask for the address, what should I get? A1, it's going to go 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11. It should be B11. It didn't select B11. It just said, I'm referring to A1, and from there, I'm referring to a different cell, and then I'm asking for the address of that cell. So any cell has an offset method. I give it a couple of arguments, and it returns a reference to another cell. Well, folks, while we're on it, so this, refer, this refers to a, what kind of object does this refer to? It refers to, uh, collection. no, range A1 is not a collection. It's a cell. Okay, so this refers to a cell. Because it's a cell, it's got an offset method. What does this refer to? That's another cell. So does this have an offset method? 
Could I do, this looks weird, but could I do this? Sure. Because to be able to say dot offset, all that has to be true is that whatever I have over here, that has to refer to a cell. Or it could be a range, it could be multiple cells. And so that's B11, so this should be C22, C21, C21. And Excel does not care how many times you do that. That's O141. Why might you do that? Where might you see something like this? On the midterm exam. That's where you might see something. There's not really a great reason that I can think of to do it, you know, multiple ones here, but you under, if you understand this idea of being able to call a method from a, another object, however you refer to it, you'd be able, I wouldn't give you anything this complex, but you, you can probably see something like that again. Okay. So now we're, we're activating the next cell. I want to put one more thing here. This is where we'll end. This is probably something you should put inside of every loop you make. Right at the very end, put the statement do events. Without do events, if you accidentally put <coughs> yourself into a loop that has no way out, if you accidentally created an endless loop, there's no way to stop the loop. That loop is, Excel gets so focused on processing that loop that you can't break into it, you can't stop it, you have to kill Excel. Back, every time I make a new loop, I always like to save just before I run it. Oh, I just hit play instead of save. <laughs> Fortunately, I got two events in there. It looks like it's actually got. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I can hit pause. I could without two events, I'd have been sunk. Whew. Oh, I don't have any. I don't have the until in here. Until active cell. Dot offset, no, active cell dot value is blank. That's what I mean. This is going to activate the next cell, but I haven't given it any way out. Thank goodness I had to do it next. I forgot to save. I'm going to save now. Just in case. Right, let's try it again. Let's do events again. Do events just tells, it tells the interpreter, listen, I know you're busy running this loop over and over and over again, but pause for just a second and, and look around to see if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to stop you. Um, there are other things too, you know, it, it, there could be something else that Excel is trying to do, but because I've got this loop going, it just, it won't let Excel do anything else. Uh, it won't let it refresh the screen, it won't, there are various other things. And so do events just says, or just, just look around and see if anything else is trying to get to happen, and if so, let it happen, and then continue on with the loop. But, but the key here is that it will let you hit that pause button, which will let you stop. Because, yeah. Why would you not want to have do events in there? Like, why do they make you put it in there? Because that seems very logical. Oh, it takes time. Okay. It takes time to look up and say, you know, it's not much, it's a couple milliseconds, but if you're doing a loop that's running 100,000 things, those milliseconds will add up. Okay, I think that did it. Did I run it since I fixed it? Let me come just check real quick. I'm going to clear off my labels. <laughs> Come here and run my code. Takes a couple of seconds, and now I've got the labels for everybody properly formatted, all properly lined, uppercase, no punctuation. That's it. Questions? All right. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.